Making a turn, mounting a curb, and hitting a light pole. The driver, a Toronto police officer. What caused them to lose control of their vehicle? Pedestrians and cyclists just meters away. Good evening. The drama playing out in a densely populated section of the city. This latest incident now prompting pointed questions from politicians. CTV's John Woodward is live with tonight's top story. John. Michelle, it was a very busy area. Towers all around. We talked to plenty of people today who say they could have been crushed by that light pole, but for dumb luck. There were plenty of people in this downtown street when this video shows a Toronto police cruiser rounding the corner, jumping the curb and hitting a light pole, knocking it to the ground. Residents of the towers around Dan Lucky Way and Fort York Boulevard recorded officers cordoning off the area and inspecting the debris left behind by the crash Saturday morning, which caused significant damage to the cruiser. Holy. The video astonishing to Keith Smith, who has lunch regularly with his crew in exactly the spot that light pole fell. Dang, it's crazy. I don't know how he managed to, like, not straighten himself out. If we'd have been sitting here, we'd have been done. That's unbelievable. Debris still there Monday, though city pylons replaced the down pole. Police said the male driver lost control. The female passenger was taken to hospital with minor injuries. The surveillance video obtained by biking lawyer David Shelnut. When I woke up to this video sent by a concerned member of the public, I was flabbergasted. He says the careless driving should be unacceptable to Toronto police. When you're just driving around, guys, you've got to follow the rules of the road like everybody else. It's you we look to uh, to lead an example on road safety. The crash comes on the heels of several other incidents that have made the news, including a cyclist seriously injured by a police cruiser turning on Bloor Street, a pedestrian run into as she crossed the road on Dufferin Street at Liberty, and numerous automated speeding and red light tickets uncovered by CTV News of police vehicles. The police have a lot of vehicles out there and that people make mistakes. Councillor John Burnside is a former police officer who now sits on Toronto's police board. He says he'll ask the service to disclose how exactly these traffic incidents are dealt with. There has to be transparency and people have to feel confident in the police service that they are not acting above the law. Something these workers agree with. They need to be accounted, uh, held accountable for their actions just like the rest of us, right? They feel they're lucky they weren't under the pole when it fell. We did ask Toronto Hydro the cost of repairing and replacing a pole like this. They said it runs between five and twelve thousand dollars. Not clear if the Toronto Police Service will be footing the bill. Reporting live, I'm John Woodward. Nathan, back to you. Thank you, John. You can watch that video again on our digital platforms. Visit ctvnewstoronto.ca and download the CTV News app. Next is something else that's increasingly under the microscope at City Hall, the ballooning costs around Toronto's involvement in the 2026 FIFA World Cup. Believe it or not, the price tag is getting steeper. CTV's Natalie Johnson is live with more. Natalie. Well, Nathan, $380 million, that is the newest price tag on the Toronto portion of the tournament. City staff say ever since the official match schedule was released a few weeks ago, they have been working to refine their estimates and assumptions, and it turns out that hosting the World Cup here will cost a whole lot more than previously expected. The World Cup cost is climbing yet again, meaning Toronto taxpayers will be on the hook for millions more than last thought. It's important that we are transparent, that we are realistic, and at the time, um, no one anticipated the rate of inflation of today. City staff are now projecting that the cost of hosting six world-class soccer matches in this city will hit $380 million, up from $300 million estimated in June 2022, when Toronto was officially named a host city. Unfortunate that it's gone up, but I think it's a positive uh, contribution to this uh, city and we're putting this, this city on the world map. The increase blamed on Toronto hosting one more game than originally expected. In addition to updated estimates on safety and security requirements, vendor quotes and inflation. It's absurd. The agreement that John Tory oversaw uh, didn't just drop the ball. He scored an own goal. Um, there the amount of money that Toronto is putting into this versus other levels of government is embarrassing. The province has pledged $97 million toward Toronto's hosting cost. Ottawa has committed to supporting the endeavour, but the dollar figure is still a question mark. There's a sort of almost unquantifiable uh, benefit 
to just putting on one of these events and, and putting the city on the world stage. Previous city estimates pegged the GDP benefit to Toronto at $392 million, $456 million to the province. The reality is we can't pay our bills on the GDP. Uh, it will be the provincial and the federal government that will be the large benefactors of that additional revenue spent over the course of World Cup. Councillors now calling on Queen's Park and Ottawa to dole out more dollars to help pay Toronto's tab. City staff, meanwhile, are considering directing some of the revenue from the municipal hotel tax to the FIFA bill, also looking to leverage more private sector sponsorships. Reporting live at City Hall, I'm Natalie Johnson. Michelle, over to you. Thank you, Natalie. Straight ahead, the province setting its sights on post-secondary institutions. What students need to know as the government rolls out more than a billion dollars in funding. Have you spent much time outside today? Certainly doesn't feel like February, does it? And it's been that way for weeks. Unseasonably mild conditions right across southern Ontario. And they're going to stick around for a while. CTV Sean Lethong is live with more. Sean. Well, Michelle and Nathan, it was really nice out in the sun today, but since the sun's gone down, it has gotten a little bit cooler. I just saw a guy run by in shorts. There's been a lot of stuff like that today. I don't think we're there yet, but it has been a very nice day when you consider just what time of year it is. It's a day to bask in a little late February warmth. So we're just kind of down by the lake shore, enjoying the views. Little man is enjoying the sun. Down at Humber Bay Shores, the sun offers a great chance to take a picture. And for those who like being outside, a perfect place to take a walk or a bike ride home. This is 20K out. I was planning on going home on the TTC, but then I'm thinking, oh, it's rush hour, so maybe not. So I'm riding a nice long ride home. Walking his dog on his lunch break, Simon Morrison is happy he doesn't have to bundle up, but one of many people who can't help but think. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been awesome, but at the same time, it's kind of worrying. It's like global warming, right? Everyone loves the sunshine and the warm weather, but it's a little concerning that we're having this warm weather in February. Driving with the top down, this guy isn't worried at all. I love it, to be honest. Like, people are talking about global warming and... They're really scared of global warming. I welcome global warming. Welcome or not, this weather is well above normal. A stark contrast from this past weekend where temperatures sunk to minus 15. For Kevin and his son Kazen, they wanted to take this time to make wife Elisa feel special. It's my wife's birthday tomorrow. <laughs> so if this does get on uh, CTV, I'd like to wish Aww. her a happy birthday. So happy birthday to her, but on her actual birthday tomorrow, the weather could change. It could be a little bit darker. It could be a little bit clowner, but a touch warmer. I'll let Jess talk about that. Reporting live, I'm Sean Lethon. All right, thank you, Sean. He needs to do more for the birthday, by the way. All right, so the big question, how long can these uh, temperatures last? How long do we expect them to last? Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Hey, Jessica. Hey, well, Sean's right. It's only going to get nicer as we head into the day tomorrow and our Wednesday. Likely some record-breaking days ahead of us, but it comes at a cost with some active weather on the, on the way in rain and the risk of some thunderstorm activity. But for now, it is dry. Through parts of northern Ontario, though, there are some alerts in place for some snowfall. For us, we're clear for the active weather, at least for now. Temperature-wise, we're still at 12 through Windsor, 10 in London, 6 in Hamilton, 7 in Peterborough. It is mild. Over towards the island and through Pearson, still pretty comfortable out there, right around four or five degrees tonight still well above seasonal heading in towards the middle of the week although it comes with active weather we are looking at near 14 15 degree daytime highs coming up a full look at your long-range forecast right now send it back over to michelle and nathan thank you jess if you are a transit user there's a chance you're now paying less to use the system across the gta the one fair program rolling out to more riders only being charged once even if you're transferring between systems ctv scott lightfoot reports Fantastic, fantastic. It's the, the best. A great start to the work week for many commuters. I, I ride the TTC from North York, and then I'm coming here. I, I ride the Viva Blues going to Richmond Hill. I start from Yorkdale till Markham, so it's good. I have to take two buses and one line, line one also. Those taking multiple transit systems to and from work each day will now pay just one fare for the whole way. I travel all the way from downtown King Station to Markham, so it's going to save me the, uh, the Viva transfer every day, so that will be upwards of $6 every day, so that adds up quickly. So it's really going to benefit me because right now, I'm paying TTC and paying for the GO bus transit, which is really expensive. Getting more people to take transit is the goal of the One Fare program, which connects Brampton Transit, Durham Region Transit, My Way, York Regional Transit, GO, and the TTC. 
For riders going between GO and the TTC, the TTC fare will be free. For those going from one local transit system to another, the second fare will be free. It nets out at a, at a zero TTC ride cost, uh, which is great. It's going to encourage more transit uh, ridership, uh, more transit use, and that's really the goal here. Uh, and of course, we get reimbursed by the province under this program, which is, which is great, so it's revenue neutral. Many heading to work today were already making plans for the money they will save. Savings, yeah, I guess. Good for, like, probably we'll travel more on weekends. Close, close to $200 a month. If, no, wait, 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 yeah. What are you going to do with that? Uh, I don't know, maybe more dates. Scott Lightfoot, CTV News. Coming up, charmed out of $350,000. The new crypto scam tactics seducing savvy investors. Pat Foran has what you need to know. The province is opening its pocketbook in an effort to stabilize colleges and universities. The ministry announcing funding to the tune of $1.3 billion over the next three years. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris is live with more. Siobhan. Well, think of this as a last-minute extension on your final paper. That's true for colleges and universities, but they say today's announcement is not nearly enough to keep them going. It's an infusion for Ontario colleges and universities running on life support. Today I'm announcing $1.3 billion in new spending for post-secondary institutions. The cash spread over three years is only about half the $2.5 billion a government-appointed panel said was needed to keep the doors open. Most of the funding is for operations. With $203 million specifically for those schools identify at medium or high risk. Then there's some earmarked for STEM education, mental health support and on-campus repairs. While the minister concedes schools need help, the government ignored another panel recommendation to have students pay more. I will not apologize for continuing to freeze tuition in this province. The premier has been made very clear that this is an affordability issue. Extending the freeze until 2026, but for Ontario students only. And what we know is going to happen is that the burden of funding our post-secondary institutions is going to fall on international students, and that is shameful. Those students already pay tens of thousands more than Ontario students in Ontario schools do. The minister didn't share a plan to help fill the void to come as Ottawa cuts student visas to get a handle on the housing crisis. I have been very clear in my disappointment on the, the federal government's unilateral decision. But it's a change the opposition feels the government should have seen coming. The Auditor General had been sounding the alarm on this, that you can't maintain a, a sector that relies on international student tuition to the extent that Ontario colleges and universities were. Universities are at a breaking point. With 10 running deficits expected to total $273 million next year. The province did provide valuable short-term relief that will help, but failed to provide the long-term predictability and certainty of growing revenues that meet the needs of our today's students. The government is also asking colleges and universities to be more transparent about where tuition fees go and how much individual courses cost when textbooks and other materials are factored in. The government's also asking or saying, pledging that it will in, uh, introduce better enforcement and oversight of private career colleges, which have exploded in recent years, but they haven't offered much detail. Reporting live from Queen's Park, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan, back to you. All right, thank you, Siobhan. Meanwhile, roughly 3,000 York University employees are walking off the job. The union representing striking workers and the school blaming each other for failed negotiations. Our Janice Golding joins us live with more on this. Janice. Hi, Michelle. About 55,000 students attend York University, and as of today, they don't have instructors for more than half of their classes. You gotta fight, and you gotta win. You gotta what? Fight. Their voices didn't ring out in lecture halls today. Instead, the rallying cries of striking academic workers were heard at the heart of campus. And so turn to your neighbor and repeat after me. Neighbor, I promise to hold the line. 3,000 contract faculty teaching and graduate assistants, research assistants and part-time librarians promising to fight in solidarity for better wages and job security. If you want to have a workforce that's teaching over 50% of your classes, you need to treat them fairly than if you want the students to go to class. Tiana Leonte is a sessional lecturer. She says she teaches three classes but only makes $2,000 a month. I get paid less now as a contract 
instructor than I did as a TA in my master's degree in 2013. The strikers' demands for what they call a livable wage echoed by labor leaders. These workers have to have two and three jobs on top of their teaching job. Many of them, we think as close as 70% of them, are using food banks in order to feed themselves because their wages are so far behind inflation. This includes the uh, inflationary rise in living costs, the Bill 124 that uh, limited uh, wage increases to 1% for so long. In a statement, York said, we offered two consecutive proposals on February 7th and the 21st, which addressed crucial items, including increase in rates of pay. Thus far, none of these proposals have been responded to at the bargaining table. But the union representing the workers says the proposals were utterly unacceptable. We accepted what was on the table today. We would not make up what we've already lost to inflation, and we certainly wouldn't be able to keep up with what comes in the next three years. York's last academic worker strike in 2018 lasted five months before the province enacted back-to-work legislation. And today, the students they teach had mixed emotions about this job action. As a student, it is a bit scary, um, the uncertainty of it all, but I'm in full support of QP and our workers. I'm definitely worried. I'm also an international student, so... It's going to affect me even more. Most of my courses, I can literally not get it done without the help of TAs. Kids pay about roughly $10,000 a year. International students, upwards of $30,000 uh, for this garbage. Now their courses are being put on hold and they can't learn anymore. They have failed to give a living wage and a living to all of the workers. Still, the striking workers say they literally can't afford to teach these students on their pay. And with the two sides so far apart, a deal could be very far off. In fact, the strike here in 2018 was the longest in Canada's post-secondary history, lasting a total of 143 days. Reporting live, I'm Janice Golding. Now back to Michelle. Thank you, Janice. We are hearing from loved ones tonight of an asylum seeker who died outside a shelter in Mississauga. As community leaders demand more support for those looking for a better life here in Canada, CTV's Beth McTonnell reports. Back home in Kenya, Delphina Gigi was called the mother of boys, a name for the wonderful way she raised her four sons. A courageous, outgoing woman who loved people, her sister says, and came to Canada in search of safety. There was so much of this, and, and now there's a lot of despair. At home, there's a lot of despair in the community. There's so many hearts that are broken. Just days after landing at Pearson and being granted asylum, those dreams were dashed. Gigi died. Community members here say the 46-year-old widow waited outside this Peel region-run shelter in Mississauga for seven hours in the freezing cold before going to hospital, suffering a cardiac event, and couldn't be saved. How can it be that somebody who... who sacrificed so much for, the, for others, Delphine didn't have to know you to be kind to you. Her sister says last year, Gigi quit her job to care for her dying father. They now hope this fundraiser will pay to help bring her body home and support her boys. My worry is that there's going to be more fatalities. In Ottawa, Brampton's mayor, Patrick Brown, met with the federal minister responsible for immigration and refugees. Gigi is the second death connected to the same shelter in recent months. What I've been told from our, sh our shelter staff is that they will use every space we have, but the demand has surged so much that 75% of individuals who need shelter are being turned away. What I heard from the minister today is that, you know, we'll rent hotel beds until we sort this out. I just, I I'm not sure they appreciate the magnitude of the numbers we're seeing. Meantime, Gigi's sister is trying to secure a visa to come here to hold a memorial, deal with her affairs, and find out why she died. It could be a combination of things. And, and, I, and I have a million thoughts in my mind. You know, I've asked myself what went wrong. We've had this conversation with my family, and we're asking, uh, is there anything that we could have done better? She says Gigi hoped to bring her sons to Canada one day, her journey a sacrifice, ending in tragedy. Beth McDonnell, CTV News. The Trudeau government tabled its Online Harms Act today. All of us expect to be safe in our homes, in our neighbourhoods and in our communities. We should be able to expect the same kind of safety in our online communities. 
Bill C-63 seeks to create a new regulator for social media services and establish an ombudsperson to advocate for users who have concerns about online safety. The legislation covers non-consensual sharing of intimate images and content used to cyberbully, urge self-harm or incite violence, terrorism or hatred. The Liberals are also amending the criminal code to introduce stiffer punishments for ex existing hate propaganda offenses. The Prime Minister has long promised to better protect Canadians online, especially youth. Leaders from nearly two dozen countries are meeting in Paris to discuss how to ramp up production of military aid for Ukraine. This comes as Russia claims another village in the east with fears of a swift advance mounting. CTV's Heather Wright reports. A Russian guided aerial bomb hit a home in Ukraine's Sumy region early this morning, killing a husband and a wife and destroying their home. All part of a barrage of missiles and drones launched over Ukraine today as Russia continues its push west. Ukrainian forces retreated from a village near Avdivka, which was taken last week, as they try to regroup and shore up defenses. In Kyiv, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky called for the fight over Crimea to continue, as he marked 10 years since the Russian occupation there began. On this day in 2014, demonstrators gathered in the Crimean capital, pushing back against Russia's incursion, a covert invasion that helped launch its full-scale assault two years ago. The return of all our captives, those deported, and the return of Crimean political prisoners are our absolute priority, he said. In exchange for a Russian political prisoner was in the works, according to one of Alexei Navalny's closest allies. Maria Pevchik says Navalny was to be exchanged for an FSB agent serving a life sentence in Berlin for murder. The fierce critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin was found dead in a Russian penal colony 10 days ago. Amid the outcry over Navalny's death, Ukraine's top spy said today that intelligence shows he died from a blood clot, a claim that is still unverified. In Paris this afternoon, 20 European leaders met to discuss efforts to speed up munitions production and show resolve against Russia's invasion. Russia cannot win, French President Emmanuel Macron said, though it's expected no new aid will be announced at this conference. Instead, leaders say they're trying to show solidarity. But today, President Zelensky said just 30 percent of the one million rounds of ammunition promised by the EU has arrived in Ukraine. Heather Wright, CTV News, Lviv, Ukraine. In the Middle East, Israel's army has reportedly presented its plan for a ground offensive into Rafah to the war cabinet. There was a deadly airstrike in Gaza's southernmost city where 1.4 million people are seeking safety. The looming offensive comes as Israel's allies have warned civilians must be protected in the war with Hamas. Benjamin Netanyahu's office also said the war cabinet has approved a plan to deliver humanitarian aid safely into Gaza, but it did not give details. In The Hague, Israel filed a report with the International Court of Justice today. It concerns measures taken to comply with an earlier ruling by the court that called on Israel to refrain from any acts that might amount to genocide. No details on the content of the report were provided. South Africa has accused Israel of state-led genocide, which Israel and some of its allies dismiss as baseless. Also today, the court heard arguments from Turkey and the League of Arab States on the final day of hearings in to the legality of Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories. The Palestinian people have a legal right to the immediate end of the occupation. And Israel has a correlative legal duty to immediately terminate the occupation. This right exists and operates simply and exclusively because the Palestinian people are entitled to it. The judges have been hearing arguments from more than 50 states and will provide a non-binding advisory opinion after a request by you, the UN General Assembly in 2022. It will likely take months. Israel has said the court's involvement could be harmful to achieving a negotiated settlement. There could be a shakeup in the Palestinian Authority. Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Shetaya announced the resignation of his government today. The move comes amid growing U.S. pressure on President Mahmoud Abbas to make changes as efforts intensify to stop the fighting and to begin work on a political structure to govern the enclave after the war. 
A boss accepted Shatea's resignation and asked him to stay on as a caretaker until a permanent replacement is appointed. Canada has opened humanitarian pathways to welcome thousands of Sudanese people fleeing the civil war as a United Nations report offers new evidence of mounting atrocities in the nation. There are a litany of human rights abuses that uh, the UN has identified. The UN says the war has resulted in the death of thousands of people and left millions displaced. It also found evidence of indiscriminate attacks on civilians and sexual violence against women and children. The organization is calling for an investigation. The Prime Minister is heading home following a weekend trip to Ukraine and Poland. But before leaving Warsaw today, Trudeau defended Canada's military spending. The world is changing. Uh, it's getting more dangerous. I recognize uh, Poland stepping up significantly in its own military spending, but so will Canada. Right now, Canada's defense spending hovers around 1.3 percent of gross domestic product. That falls short of the 2 percent NATO mandated target. Trudeau insists the Canadian Armed Forces will continue to get the equipment and the support it needs. Meanwhile, Sweden has cleared the last major hurdle in its bid to join NATO. Hungary's parliament approved the Nordic country's accession today. The vote ended months of delays and followed a visit by the Swedish prime minister during which an arms deal was signed. NATO's secretary general welcomed the ratification, saying it will make all member countries stronger and safer. Hungary was the last to approve Sweden's bid. The Odysseus moon lander is expected to stop communicating with Earth tomorrow, but it has managed to send back some new images. They show the landing site from space. Another shows the area where the craft touched down on Thursday. There are photos with an arrow showing the position of the lander. The craft will continue to collect data until sunlight no longer shines on the solar panels. That's expected to happen Tuesday morning, two to three days short of what controllers had hoped would be a week. Meantime, Japan's lunar lander has unexpectedly survived a freezing night on the moon. The country's space agency previously stated the probe was not designed to make it through a lunar night. Today it announced that a command was sent to the spacecraft and a response was received. That showed it had been able to maintain its ability to communicate. Contact was cut off for a short time due to the temperature, but preparations were being made to resume operations. Also tonight, his symptoms were dismissed, seemingly too young to be worried about colon cancer. Now, fighting a late stage of the disease, he's on a mission to lower the age for screening. I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, if you're on social media, you may see ads or stories saying you can get rich quick investing in cryptocurrencies. But be careful you don't get scammed. A Toronto woman just lost $340,000. I'll have my report. That's just ahead. And while temperatures are going up on a Tuesday, it gets really, really nice outside as we head into the afternoon. We're watching for rain and the risk of thunderstorms. So a dry start to the day, but the showers roll in just in time for the afternoon. So make sure you send the kids off to school with maybe the rain jacket and an umbrella. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. According to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, Canadians lost more than $300 million to investment scams last year. You might see an ad or stories saying you can make money fast investing in cryptocurrencies, but many of these are linked to scams. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. A Toronto woman saw a story on YouTube promising she could make money investing in cryptocurrencies. She started off with a small investment and thought she was making money. Over time, she invested $340,000 and lost it all. Natalia asked us not to identify her as she is embarrassed and frustrated after getting caught in a cryptocurrency scam. It started last fall when she saw a video on YouTube saying she could make money fast. Invest in crypto. This is the uh, most current way to get rich. She contacted the company and someone called her and convinced her to start investing with $250. When she saw that amount grow, she decided to invest even more. I trusted him and I wired him $100,000. The scammer sent her $5,000 and told her to buy herself diamond earrings. After she did that, she felt the company must be legitimate and she invested another $240,000. Seeing this 
my money grow, I got very excited. I'm like, wow, that's a great way to make money very fast. On paper, it looked like her money had doubled, but when she tried to take funds out of her account, she couldn't. That's when she realized it was fraudulent. She was scammed out of $340,000. I was ashamed to tell anybody that I got scammed so easily with so much money. We've got clients in around 700000 that have lost. We've got some that have lost 7000 it, it just varies depending on what they can get out of people. Jason Setter was scammed out of $81,000 in a crypto investment scheme. Our family is devastated. He formed Fraud Hunters, which will soon be rebranding as Cybercrime Victim Services. It will be a place for people to seek help if they're the victim of cyber fraud. They're facing suicide attempts, financial destitution, uh, divorce. Uh, it, it's, it's horrendous for a lot of these people when they call us. Natalia says losing $340,000 has been devastating for her. She wanted to share her story to warn others. I'm very upset about that, and I don't want this to happen to other people. Some people caught in crypto scams are victimized again when criminals call them to say they can get their money back. They charge a fee up front saying they can recover the funds, but it's just another scam. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Well, it was a beautiful, bright, sunny day, mild for this time of year. We're going to get up into the double digits, but there's a trade-off. Yeah, it's one of those, I guess, times of year was up and down. Don't know what to expect each day. Yeah, it's a two-for-one special you didn't ask for, because this one comes with rain and thunderstorms. But the good thing is we do need precipitation. We've had such little snow and rain over this kind of winter season, so although it Maybe people still want the snow. We're not going to get it, but we do need some of this active weather. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. The sun has set, but it's a beautiful evening across the city. Still quite mild out there. All the buildings glowing in the light of the night. And in just a few weeks, we're going to see that sunset after 7 p.m. We will still have light into the evening. It'll be really nice. But for now, dark out there. But temperature-wise, it is quite mild. We're still sitting at 5 here in the city. We're at 8 through Windsor, 1 in Ottawa. Anywhere kind of north of Muskoka, they're holding on to some cooler air that will eventually make its way towards us. But for now, we stay nice and warm. Tonight, we'll drop down to 2. The norm is minus 7. Peterborough should be at minus 11. They are nowhere close to that. The same through Bancroft. Areas in towards Windsor, London, much the same. It is a very mild night ahead of us. Getting into the day tomorrow, right around 11 degrees. The norm is one. We are 10 degrees above the seasonal average. Not quite record-breaking for us here in the city, but I wouldn't be surprised if across southern Ontario we do break some records tomorrow. Peterborough will be at 12, the same through Niagara, down through London, also at 12 degrees, but it comes with rain. So this system's kind of been cooking up through the Midwestern United States. It will make its way towards us in towards Windsor in the morning and then for the GTA more through the lunch hour. So let's time everything out. Both of these systems kind of come in at the same time and sandwich us in between them. So as we head throughout the day, we're going to get waves of this. So just be prepared. Uh, but the good news is we're at least dry for the drive to and from work. Uh, through the rest of our evening, just a few light clouds out there getting into tomorrow morning, even a little sunshine. It starts down towards Windsor and London, likely with a little bit of thunderstorm activity. That line of showers comes through just in time for the lunch hour. Then we get a break for that evening drive. Overnight, the showers were Turn, the risk of thunderstorms off and on throughout your Wednesday. But as temperatures drop into the evening, that rain turns to snow as that system continues to rotate counterclockwise. So temperature wise, very mild tomorrow, likely a record breaking day on Wednesday, 14 degrees, the daytime high minus six for the low, which is seasonal, but it will likely freeze a lot overnight. So just be careful for your drive on Thursday morning. A few light flurries to start the day and then sunshine to welcome in the month of March. And then as we get into that first weekend of March, we are back into the double digits by Sunday and looking into next week. Pretty nice. Nathan, Michelle. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks. Also tonight, are you devoted to your grocery store? A new survey reveals Canadians are feeling the pinch of high food prices and opting to take their hard earned money elsewhere. He is in the fight of his life, battling stage four colorectal cancer. Just 45 years old, now speaking out for lowering screening ages. Here's CTV's Pauline Chan. Bishop Brigante says his songs have always been about survival, and that's the focus of his new petition as well. I had so many different uh, symptoms, and they were constantly dismissed as being hemorrhoids, fatigue, like just, you know, like, like oh, you got to work out more or 
um, irritable bowel syndrome. 45-year-old Brigante was diagnosed with colorectal cancer last October after complaining of symptoms for months. Now he's doing chemotherapy, and he started a petition bringing it to Queen's Park. The age at which screening for colorectal cancer begins is currently 50. We petitioned to have it lowered to 30. Dr. Shadi Ashmala says it's a cancer that is showing up more in the younger population. And what we're seeing when it's being measured in decades, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, all those rates are going up every year by almost 10% across the board. But in the 50 and up age group, the rate of increase for colorectal cancer is actually slowing down thanks to successful screening, says Dr. Ashmala. You know, in the United States, they decrease the age of screening to 45 and they do screening colonoscopies and fecal immunohistochemistry tests at 45. I think that's an easy low-hanging fruit that we should really follow suit here in the province. But whether screening should begin at 30, Heshmala says the research is still being done. And he points out there is a difference between screening for the general population and for those with symptoms. Screening is based on having zero symptoms. That's what a screening test is. Anyone with symptoms at any age needs to be investigated. And, and that's no longer a screening colonoscopy, that's a diagnostic colonoscopy. Colonoscopies are also available earlier for people with a first-degree relative, parents, children or siblings, who has had colorectal cancer. Brigante says he may have been angry before about not getting earlier screening. I know that I'm a vessel of survival. I'm a vessel of change. But now what he really wants is to change the screening age. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Alec Baldwin's manslaughter trial is set to begin July 10th. The actor is accused in the fatal 2021 shooting of cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the set of the movie Rust. A revolver Baldwin was holding fired a live round that also wounded the director. The actor has said he is not responsible for the shooting and plans to file a motion for charges to be dismissed. Don Henley testified at a trial focusing on a draft lyrics to songs on the hit album Hotel California. The Eagles co-founder arrived at court in New York where he said he never gave away his handwritten lyrics. The Grammy winner says they were stolen decades ago from one of his properties. The three defendants bought them years later through a writer who had worked with the band. The defense maintains Henley willingly gave them to the scribe. The UK's Royal Mint is honoring late singer-songwriter George Michael with a collectible coin. It depicts Michael wearing his trademark sunglasses and pays tribute to his 1987 hit, Faith. The coin is available for purchase starting today and was approved by Michael's estate. It's the latest addition to the Royal Mint's Music Legends series. It has previously honored David Bowie, Elton John and Queen. Two Canadian comedians are set to travel the country together this spring. Rick Mercer and Jan Arden are joining forces for a nationwide tour. The pair is promising an evening of laughter and stories during the 16-day runs of shows. It all begins April 27th in Kitchener. The duo is in Toronto on May 12th. Canadian acting cousins Stephen and Robbie Amell are returning to the small screen. After the success of their film Code 8, the fans wanted and got a part two. CTV's Andrea Case joins us now live from the TIFF Lightbox with more on the power of that fandom. Andrea. Hel yes, hello, good afternoon. We just said we're live, and yes, we are live. We're here with Jeff, the director. We're here with Stephen Amell and Robbie Amell. They are cousins, not brothers, as many people say. Code 8, part 2. Tell us why you had to do a part 2. Well, you know, we always wanted to make a sequel to our... It started off as a short film, then we made a, a movie. I think we think it turned out pretty well. There was, uh, you know, a lot of excitement over it. And when we got the option to make a part two, it just was a dream come true, you know? What is it like being in Toronto for this premiere? I mean, this is pretty impressive. You've got all kinds of people here, a lot of fans. Uh, uh, crowdsourcing was a big part of getting the first one made. You've got a lot of fans here. What does it mean to you to have the fans here today? Well, I mean... Uh, all three of us grew up in Toronto, and um, you know to be to be at the, you grew up in Toronto, right? Vancouver. Vancouver, my bad. Canada, I Canada. Canada. I live in Toronto. I live in Toronto. Not cousin. I knew that I made a mistake the moment that I said that. But <laughs> being at the most prestigious like theater, I think right now in Canada, with two sold out theaters, with a lot of people that backed the first movie, but again, this being our hometown, this this what Netflix has done, um, culminating our press tour here and celebrating the movie is just extraordinary, dream come true. 
Robbie, a lot of this film was shot in this area, the GTA. What is it like to make a film here? This is pretty much an all-Canadian cast, an all-Canadian production, other than, I guess, the composer. So what is it like to, to keep so many people employed? It's a tough business. <laughs> We're very lucky. We have a lot of the crew from the short film uh, and almost the entire crew from Code 8 Part 1. And mm -hmm. we're lucky they're the best crew in the city. Everybody, there's something special about this project. Everybody takes ownership of it, takes a ton of pride in it, shares it. And um, that's why we get to be here tonight with all of them. Okay. Well, thank you. Amel Cousins, uh, director, uh, used to be working in, was it in television? Yeah, I was. Uh, I worked in the score as a, as a live camera operator. Did you really? I did. I didn't know yeah. that. There you go. I do my research. Like I say, fellas, get moving and enjoy. Thank you very much. I think a lot of other people want to talk to you. Congratulations, congratulations, and congratulations. Uh, you can see this on Netflix. It starts on February 28th. It is called Code 8 Part 2. I'm Andrea Case. I'll send it back to the studio. Andrea, you are the Thanks. queen of rallying the cast to go live on CTV News. Thank you so much. Bye, gentlemen. After the break, the future is bright for Canadian soccer star Alfonso Davies. Amid a report, he's reached a verbal agreement to join the prestigious Real Madrid. There has to be transparency and people have to feel confident in the police service that they are not acting above the law. Updating our top stories, a Toronto City Councillor will ask police to disclose how police traffic incidents are dealt with after a cruiser hit a light pole downtown on Saturday. Several other incidents that have made the news. It's important that we are transparent, that we are realistic, and at the time, um, no one anticipated the rate of inflation of today. The projected cost to host six World Cup soccer matches in Toronto is now at least $380 million. That is up from the $300 million estimated when we were named a host city. If you want to have a workforce that's teaching over 50% of your classes, you need to treat them fairly than if you want the students to go to class. 3,000 York University academic workers are on strike for seeking better wages and job security. York says it presented two proposals this month that included pay increases. On the markets, the Canadian dollar is down a fraction to 7404 U.S. Oil is up slightly to 7758 U.S. a barrel. And the TSX Composite Index is down 88 points to end the day at 21,324. Many of us are looking for the best deals and discounts at the grocery store as food prices keep climbing. But what may be surprising is how many shoppers have actually switched supermarkets in the hopes of spending less. Here's CTV's Peter Sperling. When shopping for a family, every dollar counts. Yeah, definitely we're looking for deals. Sam Norwood spends about $300 a week on groceries and goes where the savings are. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I feel like it, well... Still young, but it used to be a lot more. You just go to like one store, um, but now we definitely sh shop around. Many Canadians swapping their go-to grocery store in search of lower prices. That was a shocker. I mean, uh, over 60% of Canadians have actually switched stores, primary store, because they weren't uh, enough discounts. Uh, that's a lot. So it means that really people... Uh, are, are walking away from grocers who aren't necessarily offering discounts. In store, many shoppers consistently seek out discounted food products with expiring or clearance items at the top of their shopping list, according to a survey by the Dalhousie Agri-Food Analytics Lab. Clearly, uh, consumers are expecting as an incentive a 50% discount. 30% uh, is popular, but the most popular option is 50%. Loblaw recently scrapped the 50% discount only to flip-flop and bring it back again. Their stores are the top destination for discounted food, the survey found, followed by Walmart, Costco, Metro, including Food Basics, and Giant Tiger. Yeah, I love Giant Tiger. Canned goods, eggs, milk, cream, everything, because it's way better price here. These shoppers going where the deals are. Walmart, um, yeah. no frills, Giant Tiger... We yeah. do it all. We have two or three that we would always go to. Now we probably go to one or two more. <laughs> Grocery prices have been increasing dramatically, so, you know, anything I can save, well, it's money in my pocket and not in theirs. The Dalhousie report also finding that fresh produce is the most purchased discount item. Peter Sperling, CTV News. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. 
Canadian soccer star Alfonso Davies has reportedly reached a verbal agreement to join Real Madrid. The Athletic says Davies will join the Spanish club later this year or in 2025. The plan is for him to make the move as a summer transfer or when his contract with Bayern Munich ends next year. The 23-year-old has spent the last six seasons with the German squad, helping them win five titles. The Toronto Raptors will be going for a third straight win when they take on Pascal Siakam and the Pacers tonight. Kelly attacking, flips it up and through. Toronto is coming off a 123-121 to win over the Atlanta Hawks on Friday. The Raps are looking to remain undefeated since returning from the All-Star break. Tonight's game in Indiana gets underway shortly after 7. All right, so we could have some rain tomorrow, possible? Yeah, it's going to rain tomorrow afternoon. So just keep the umbrella. You'll need it for kind of that midpoint of the day. And then as we head in towards the evening, we get a bit of a break. So we're kind of bookended by a dry spell. So dry for the morning commute, dry for the evening commute. It's that thunderstorm in the middle. But it stays warm right through until Wednesday night. Thank you so much. Yes, that's it for us. But be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Allman with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thank you so much for watching and have a great night.